Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Pastor Derek Dillon, the executive pastor here at the Way Bible Church. We are hope that this broadcast coming up, that you will be blessed. God will touch your life in ways that you have never experienced before. Hey, if you are in the Sulphur Springs area, we would love to have you here at the Way Bible Church in person so we can love on you and tell you how much you mean to us. Hey, get ready to enjoy this message, and it gives me a great pleasure to say, Welcome home. And we hope that you are enjoying this series called The Polar Express. We want to say welcome to our online family watching all around the world. Thank you so much for our online church family. We're grateful for you and glad that you're with us. Begin to open your Bible this morning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 2. The Gospel of Luke, chapter number 2, is where we're going to kick things off this morning. And if you're here this morning, we want to encourage you today that uh, if you're a first-time family member, would you grab this Connect card out of the chair in front of you? If it's your first time at TWBC today, we already consider to you family. There's no place like home and we want this to be your church home. So we want to uh, get in touch with you. So if you grab this connect card out of the chair in front of you, fill out this bottom portion and bring it to the connect center on the west wall over here where we have a gift for you from the church and we want to get to know you just a little bit better and find your place of belonging right here at TWBC. And also if you did not get a connect guide, grab one of these before you leave. It's got all things pertaining to TWBC and the big thing we got coming up is this coming Tuesday night is our Christmas Eve service and we want you you to be a part of it. If you're excited about Christmas Eve, give God a good hand clap of praise today. That's what we've been building for, and you think we went over the top and things are crazy today. Just wait till our Christmas Eve service. It's going to be the most fun service you'll ever have been a part of. We're going to have train rides outside. There's going to be a sleigh outside with some photo booths outside. You can take photo booth pictures anywhere inside. There's going to be an awesome, awesome time of worship with you and your family, plus a lot of fun. Everything starts at 8 o'clock, so get here at 8 o'clock and enjoy the experience of TWBC as we celebrate one thing, Jesus Christ and Jesus. Jesus Christ alone. He is not just the reason for the season. He is the season itself. Amen. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. And so as we're jumping into this morning's message, the title is called The Arrival. And as you're looking in your Bibles in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number two, verse number eight, we just saw a video where the boy finally gets through all the mess of the traveling to get to the place of his arrival, the destination of where he wants to be. And the excitement of the arrival is so great the struggles that he went through to get there. In your life, a lot of people may not understand why you're so excited about one thing or another thing. They don't understand why you're excited about your 10th year of marriage or your 50th year of marriage, but they haven't gone through the struggles you've gone through to get to that celebration. Amen? And so I want to encourage you, like you celebrate, understand they haven't gone through what you've gone through to get there. The Bible says this, he who has been forgiven much loves much. And I don't know about you, but I get excited about Jesus because I know how much he's forgiven me of. Well, actually, I don't know how much he's forgiven me of. He's forgiven me of more than I could ever know or imagine. And so I love much and I want to love him extravagantly. And so if people don't understand my excitement, I'm not too concerned about it. But I do know this, they don't understand what God's done in my life either. And I want you to have an extravagant expression of your love for Jesus in a way that only you can show your great love for Jesus because nobody knows what you've gone through either. Nobody knows the trials you've been through either. Nobody knows your hurts, your heartaches, your pains, and your troubles that you've gone through to get to just to be at this worship service this morning. So when you are celebrating and shouting, I know God is doing something in your life, but I don't know all the struggles that it took for you to get here. And so in your life, I want to encourage you to celebrate every moment. And as they're getting to the destination, the arrival, it's what we're all waiting for. And it's getting to the place that you've always dreamed about in your life. In the movie, it's always great. But what happens when you get to the arrival, and sometimes it's not what you thought it would be. What happens when you get to the arrival, and sometimes it's not what you thought it would be. And sometimes the expectation of the destination... It's greater than the destination itself, Dale. Have you ever been in that moment in life? The expectation of the destination was greater than the destination itself. And disappointments in life occur because the reality of what it is doesn't meet the anticipation or the expectation of what we imagined it to be. The reality of it is different from what we actually thought it would be or expected it to be like. 
We find people in newlyweds all the time and the imagination and the anticipation and the expectation of marriage soon dwindles away after about the first year because the reality of waking up every day in the same house to the dirty dishes and the dirty laundry and the reality of marriage doesn't meet the expectation or the anticipation of what you thought it would be sometimes. And so in your life, here's the question I have for you this morning. And I've asked a question at the beginning of every message throughout this series, and so today will be no different. Your question this morning is, what happens when the moment moves on and you're left with the mess that is the miracle? What happens, Christina, when the moment moves on and now you're left with this mess that is the miracle that you've been praying for? The wedding day moves on. And you're left with this marriage that is the miracle that you've been praying for, but it doesn't meet the expectations of what you thought it would be. What happens when the moment moves on? What happens when a new day comes? And here's the thing. In the miracle, if your heart is not affected, you will only remember the sign and miss what is significant. In the middle of the miracle... Alex, in the middle of the miracle, if our heart isn't changed or transformed, we'll only remember the sign and we'll miss what is truly significant. If you didn't realize the word significance, the first four letters of the word significant equal sign. And so a sign is awesome, but a sign is always more than just what you see. It points to something that's greater and more significant. And since I've been talking about marriages and weddings all morning, I want to use this illustration one more time. And the sign of the wedding was awesome. The wedding day was amazing, and the bride was beautiful, and the groom was awesome, and life was perfect in that moment. And the sign was an amazing wedding, but did you miss the significance of the vows that you said? Some of you would do good to go back and revisit the vows, not the photos. I'm praying for marriages this morning. I don't know why I got marriage on my mind this morning. Some of us would do good to go back and revisit when you got born again what was significant and not just the environment that you got saved in. Some of us would do good this morning to go back and look again at our kids and realize what is significant about Christmas rather than serving them all the presents under the tree. So... I don't want you in this life, and especially today, to see a miracle happen and your heart not be affected, and you only remember the sign and you miss what is truly significant. When you found in Luke chapter number two, we're going to kick this off in verse number eight, and the Bible says this, and in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news. Everybody say good news. Of great joy. Everybody say great joy. Now, I have a question about the writer of this gospel to Luke. I would ask him this one question. If it's good news, why wouldn't there automatically just be great joy? Why did you have to phrase it good news of great joy? Could there possibly be good news that just brings happiness, but this is good news of something greater than happiness. It's good news of the heart of God called great joy that he sent to the earth to see a savior come as the son of God to bring salvation to a lost and dying mankind. See, it's good news of great joy because there's something greater than happiness that you'll encounter if you'll step into the presence and see what is significant and not just notice the sign. All right, that's not even a part of the message. That's bonus material. It will be good news of great joy that will be for Joel T. Meyer. For all people. It'll be for all people. So you need to write, erase all people or scratch it out or put an asterisk beside it and draw an arrow to the bottom of your Bible that says your name and write your name down. Because it's good news of great joy for the people of Sulphur Springs, Texas in the year 2019 on December 22nd because God's got a word for you that is good news of great joy that'll get you through happiness and bring you to fulfillment. I may not get to the message. 
the scripture just comes alive when you read it and I love it and it says for unto you born this day in the city of David is is a savior who is Christ the Lord now the the word Christ means anointed one and his anointing so every time you say Jesus you're declaring who he is but when you say Christ you're declaring what he came to do bring his anointing and he is the anointed one and so, who is Christ the Lord? And this will be a sign. Everybody say a sign. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel of multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom with he is pleased. And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem, which means house of bread, and see this thing called the bread of life that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us today. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered what uh, what the shepherds told them. But Mary, everybody say, but Mary. But Mary Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen and heard, just as it had been told unto them. If your heart is not affected, you'll only remember the sign, and you'll miss what is significant And could some of our problems today be because we've only celebrated the sign and missed what is significant? Could some of the problems of church in American society today be because we only celebrate the signs of Christmas and Easter and we miss what is significant about Christmas and Easter? Could some of the problems with American society as a whole today be because we love to celebrate all the signs about Christianity but we're not affected in our heart by the significance of what Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary could some of our issues be in our home that we got posters and plaques and pictures hanging on the wall that say everything that we need to know but it's only a sign and we never look past the sign to what was significant about it in our life could some of our problems be is that we're seeing a bunch of signs but we're missing what is significant a lot of people saw the signs but mary saw what was significant and the first question i asked you this morning was this what happens when the moment moves on and you're left with the mess that is the miracle see the stars were a sign that moved on but mary everybody say but mary The angels were a sign that came and made an announcement, declared it, and then departed back to the heavenlies. Elbow your neighbor and say, but Mary. Now listen, the shepherds saw a sign, enjoyed the experience, and went home. Elbow your other neighbor and say, but Mary. Then say, I'm sorry, you're my second choice. (laughs) Right? Right? The wise men. The wise men came from afar and we're going to talk a lot about them on Christmas Eve and I'm so excited for my Christmas Eve message I want to start preaching it now and so I almost didn't put wise men in there because I knew I would get distracted like I am right now wanting to talk about what I want to talk about Christmas Eve because it's so awesome and it continues right on with this so I'll see you Tuesday at 8 o'clock the wise men came to offer up a one time gift as a sign everybody say there's something about Mary and we're not talking about the movie There's something about Mary that is different. Mary encountered all the signs. All the shepherds saw the signs. The wise men saw the signs. Joseph saw the signs. All the oxen that were around saw the signs. Everybody saw the signs. But how come out of everybody mentioned in the account of the Christmas story, whether it's the parts in Matthew or the parts in Luke, how come Mary is the only one that the Bible says anything about something happening in her heart? Mark, have we ever, have we ever noticed that before? Out of everybody in the Christmas story, Richard, out of everybody in the Christmas story, I read it over and over, and it says, but Mary saw all the signs the angel visited her as well 
She met Elizabeth and John the Baptist jumped in the womb and so did Jesus and she saw the signs, but only Mary had something happen in her heart. Her eyes saw the sign, but get this, her eyes saw the sign, but her life had changed because her heart saw what was significant. If you're going to move from seeing signs to seeing what is significant, you got to quit seeing with just your physical eyes and you got to see what God is doing, but you got to see more than just with your physical eyes. You got to see the signs that He's saying and you got to see it with your heart so they become significant. See, Mary saw all the signs, Joseph saw all the signs, the wise men saw the signs, the shepherds saw the signs, everybody saw the signs, the angels were the sign. But Mary saw the signs with her heart and it was significant to her and out of everybody who appeared at the Christmas story the shepherds came and declared he is the Messiah the wise men came and declared he is the Messiah Joseph we're not sure what happened to him after the age of Jesus's 12 12 years old age we're not sure what happened to his life or in his life but the Bible specifically shows this the same Mary that pondered these things in her heart and and saw what was significant the same Mary who birthed significance was at the cross understanding significance And it was so significant in her heart, she followed all of his ministry all the way through and was there at the very end. And even some of Jesus' last phrases were directly to his mother and the apostle that he loved, John. And he said, son, behold your mother, behold your son. Something so significant happened in her life at the birth of Jesus when she saw all these things. But she just didn't see the sign. She saw it with her heart and she found out what was significant and it brought her all the way to the resurrection. Not just the death, come on. It brought her to the resurrection. Some of you have seen signs of Christianity and you've been a part of signs of Christianity. You're actually a part of one this morning if you're in church today. But my question is, will something move 18 inches from head knowledge to heart significance? And will God transform your heart this morning or will today just be another awesome, amazing service? And can we give our worship team a hand clap of praise this morning? I mean, phenomenal job. Especially, can we give the string quartet a good hand clap of praise? The, the people who are over there. And we see all this amazingness in church this morning. But are you really going to leave with something of significance? Or has it just been entertaining? Because I wonder if the Apostle Paul showed up at church this morning. I wonder if the Apostle Paul, Nick, when he walked in the room this morning, if he walked in the room this morning, would say, wow, this is awesome. And we would say, Apostle Paul, would you come with me to church? And he would look at you weird and he would say, how can I come to who you are? The Apostle Paul wouldn't even get the phrase, let's go to church, because you don't go to church. You are the church that goes to a building that brings life together when you come together as a group of believers. And so, have we become so cultured in going to church, we miss the significance that we are the church. And when services are done, the building closes, but church doesn't end, because you ain't stopping. You're going out with significance. And you're going to see the power of God in your life. And so, everyone this morning, get this, everyone who is praying for a miracle never considers the mess that it creates on the other side. Everyone who is praying for a miracle doesn't consider the mess that it creates on the other side. If the miracle is the only sign that you get, then you'll quit. If you're living your life based from miracle to miracle, you're going to end up quitting one day. Because what happens when the sign doesn't show up the way, the way you wanted it to and when you wanted it to, and you think God has abandoned you, if the miracle is only a sign, you'll quit because we never consider the size of the mess on the other side of the miracle let me explain what I'm talking about just for a minute for every crippled person that Jesus healed they now had to go get a job see we we don't read the Bible like that when Peter walked up to the guy at the gate called beautiful in Acts chapter 3 to the guy who was crippled sitting on his beggars mat that sign that said beautiful was anything but beautiful It was a sign that held no significance to him because his life wasn't beautiful. 
And at church, we come in with this mindset this time of year. It's the most wonderful time of the year when for 70% of you, it's not the most wonderful time of the year. And it's not just because you're a Grinch. It's because you're really dealing with something of pain. You're really dealing with something that hurts. You're really going through the first Christmas without a loved one. You're really trying to experience what life is like dealing with the hurts and the trials and the, and the job loss that just happened and, 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 and the loss of a family member. And you're trying to reconcile and, and, and bring to a place of, of, of happiness and joy what you can't really understand in the moment. It's not the most wonderful time of the year for a lot of people. But it can be. Because even in the midst of your worst pain, Jesus is still the promise. And if you'll let the promise become more than a sign, but become significant, good news of great joy will overshadow the hurt that's in your heart. The mess that the miracle creates in the guy's life at the gate called beautiful he was crippled for his life laying there on a mat but now he can get up and walk freely around but guess what he's a grown man he has no way to produce a living because he wasn't under an apprenticeship he wasn't like peter who was sitting in the boat with his father getting taught how to fish when jesus called him and said now you'll be fishers of men he never had that opportunity he wasn't a craftsman like joseph the carpenter who was building building furniture or houses or whatever the carpentry lifestyle was like back then he never had that apprenticeship so now he is a grown man expected to take care of himself with no knowledge or abilities or skills of how to take care of himself we don't think of the mess after the miracle what about the guy in John chapter 9 that is blind and Jesus heals him and he walks into church and the Pharisees are mad and they doubt that it's even the same guy so they bring his parents in and then they kick all three of them out of church because he was healed he was expecting to go to the temple and see it and worship for the first time instead he got kicked out of the temple what happens when the miracle creates a mess on the other side that you're not prepared for what happens when what you dreamed about isn't living up to the expectations of what you thought it would be? For every spouse that prays this prayer, Lord, I pray that my spouse would just get on fire for Jesus. There's a year of marriage counseling that follows. Because you wanted him to catch fire, but you wanted a match, and God created a bonfire. <laughs> and now this, I'll just be real blunt, now this ungodly heathen of a husband that you used to have is on fire for Jesus and you don't know how to control the flame anymore and you don't know how to control the situation anymore and so now there's more strife in your marriage than when he was not born again or living for Jesus <laughs> but you got the desire of your dream he's on fire for Jesus you just don't like the way the fire looks now I'm gonna let that set in because some of y'all are like, oh, he's preaching truth, but I ain't amening on that one. <laughs> I like it, but I don't like it, <laughs> right? Because it's truth. What about when the spouse truly catches fire? What about the promotion that you've been praying for, and now that you're promoted, you can't make it to church anymore because the promotion brought a, brought a greater set of problems? You wanted the promotion because of the pay raise, but not the problems that come with the pay raise and the promotion right and so now that you got the miracle you don't know how to deal with the mess that's after it but here's the thing about the miracle here's the the, the most awesome thing about the miracle every miracle is only a seed to a greater message the miracle was never meant to be the end the miracle was never meant to be the stopping point the miracle was never meant to be the end, the be-all, end-all, cubby. The miracle was never meant to stop the moment. The miracle was meant to really start a movement, but we took the miracle as the fruition, and the miracle was really the only the seed to a greater message. And every miracle that God does in your life is simply a seed to a greater message, but if you didn't realize, the first four letters of message are mess. See, you all want a message to preach, but you don't want to get in the mess to get it. 
See, everything that you're getting today, you say, ooh, I'm getting it from a download. I didn't get it from a download. I had to dig through the mess. I had to look through 500 different scriptures. I had to Google stuff. I had to research stuff. I had to get in a quiet place. And so what you're getting by download, I had to get by digging. To get to the message, I had to go through some mess. Come on. So my question is, the miracles and the awesome signs and the amazing answer to prayers that God does in your life, they're, they're a seed to a greater message. But you've got to outlive the mess to get to the message. And in this, Mary lived for 30 years with a mess. We, we don't read the Bible. We don't read the Bible according to actual context. We read it to uh, imagination of what we thought the Christmas story and Mary's life was really like. <laughs> right? Oh, away in a manger, no crib for a bed. No, Jesus was born in a feed trough. That cows were just licking on the salt block. And they had to move the salt block. Come on, somebody. We're, we're in Northeast Texas. We know about farming. And if he... If the cows were there eating at the feed trough where Jesus was going to be born, it wasn't clean around the feed trough because the Bible even says where their oxen are in the stable, there's a mess. But we don't want to, we don't want to recite the Christmas story at family dinner like that. Joseph so had to scoop the poop away to get to the manger to lay his kid in a, baby trough, in a feed trough wrapped in dead people burial clothes. That's what the strips of cloth are. And we exalt, Mary, you had to, oh, Mary, it would be so wonderful to be, it wouldn't be wonderful to be Mary. That's why there's something about Mary. Because Mary lived for 30 years with a kid that wasn't her husband's. And she was telling people he was the Messiah, and everybody else was saying, so you're saying God got you pregnant? Really? Could you have put up with the scrutiny of having a child that wasn't your husband's, but he's going to raise him as a parental figure, even though he's not his biological daddy, and for 30 years, you know you're living with the Messiah, the Son of God, but nobody believes you, and in fact, everybody's saying, we're just going to watch from a distance. Yeah, exactly. What's wrong with you, woman? <laughs> it's exactly what they're saying. What's wrong with you? And so in this, Mary had 30 years of dealing with the mess of public perception. But can I tell you, there was a message coming out of the mess. And nobody understands why Mary was so excited at the wedding of Canaan of Galilee when they ran out of wine. Everybody was freaking out. Mary says, this is now my opportunity, and I'm going to show everybody he is the Son of God, whether the Son of God is ready to show he's the Son of God. Jesus, you got to fix this problem. He said, this has got nothing to do with me. And she says, get ready. Do whatever he says. He's coming out. <laughs> right? 30 years of dealing with messed up public perception to get to a message. We can't stick a marriage out for a month. <laughs> Come on. Can you live with the mess that is created by the miracle that you prayed for? And the thing about it is, a lot of times the mess that you get, you prayed for it because you prayed for the miracle. Mary didn't pray for this. <laughs> God came to her and said, I've chosen you. She said, I didn't want to be picked. <laughs> right? So in this process, if the miracle is the seed, not the fruition or the fullness of it all, and there's a message coming out of the miracle, we got to get through the mess, the seed of the miracle, you've got to literally let it die. Because Jesus said this, lest a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces a harvest some of you are so busy living from your last miracle that you're missing the manna that he's trying to give you every day. And if you'll let that miracle, that seed, get buried in the dirt. Come on. The dirt's dirty. That's why it's called dirt. 
If you'll let the miracle get buried in the dirt and get covered up by the mess, maybe the thing that you think is crushing the message is actually what's fertilizing it so it blooms to become the message that you've always dreamed that it would become. What are you going to do with the miracle of the moment that you're in? Can I tell you the best thing you can do about the miracle that God gives you is not shout about it because you know there's going to be things after it that people will question you about. The one thing I've learned to do because a lot of people love to love TWBC and I love TWBC, but a lot of people think this just happened overnight. A lot of people think it just happened. But just because you just heard about us, there's a whole backstory of 20 years that you don't know. And I remember when I first heard God give me my miracle of saying, I want to call you into ministry, <laughs> there's a mess that comes with ministry too. <laughs> and so here it is in your heart, and I began to tell everybody, hey, I'm going to go start a church. And instead of, yes, we love it, that's awesome, they were like, what? Are you crazy? See, the expectation didn't live up to the reality. And so I learned to quit shouting about my miracle and become very silent about it. But in my heart, this is what I say, in a really, and it really is a godly way of saying it, okay? It's I say this, just watch and see. Just watch and see. I don't got to brag about the miracle. I don't got to shout about the miracle. The miracle was only a seed to a greater message. And when we started it 20 years ago, it was a seed to what you're seeing now. But we're just now breaking the ground. Now, some of y'all think it's the full-blown plant, but we're just barely breaking ground at TWBC. There's a whole nation out there that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're going after them, baby, starting right here with this six-county area. We're going to flood this place with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I had to go through a lot of mess. A lot of mess in my own heart. A lot of mess in my own learning processes. A lot of the mess of, oh, this is going to be so great when great has a whole different connotation in heaven. The greatest must be the servant. So with this, what is God doing in your life that the whole world is supposed to see, but the miracle is only the seed to the greater picture? I'm going to tell you to do this with your life. Go back to grinding. Go grind it out. Don't give up on it. I know some of you, this is your fourth marriage and everybody's waiting on the fourth one to fail because they think you already got the fifth one planned. I'm telling you, go home and grind it out with your husband. Pray together. Start loving each other. Start doing date night together. Start proving to people that this marriage is truly a miracle from God. You're only seeing the seed, but I'm going to get silent for a while because there's going to be a coming out party for my marriage one day when we got a 20th year anniversary coming, coming up. Come on, somebody. Well, we're going to get there. But it ain't going to be because we're going to shout, look at the miracle, it's so great, I got married again. No, it's I'm going to go home. And I'm going to deal with the mess of a marriage. And I'm not going to quit because there's a mess. In fact, I'm going to start cleaning because there's a mess. Come on. And I'm going to prove to everybody, not by how loud I talk, but by how long I preach. 20 years into that marriage, don't quit. We're almost 20 years into our marriage, and it's just now getting started. Right? Come on. It's fun. Don't quit. We're 20 years into this ministry, and we're just getting started. We ain't quitting. You may be two days into something. I'm telling you, don't quit. Don't quit. Keep pressing. And out of everything I've said this morning, I want to clarify one great big thing. What has God been showing you that started as a sign that you never let move to significant. Every time I said the word miracle this morning, some of you thought about somebody standing up out of a wheelchair. Some of you thought about a blind person seeing or somebody's delivered from alcohol or other addictions. Some of somebody being healed from a crazy disease. The only thing I've been referring to the whole morning when I've mentioned miracle is the day that Christ came into your life and you made him Lord and Savior of your life. The greatest miracle that ever takes place is not a lame person walking, but it's a heart that was hardened being transformed by the love and the power of the gospel called Jesus Christ. He is the good news of great joy. 
But my great concern this morning is, my great concern this morning is this, is that some of us say we got saved several years ago, and it was a sign, but the sign never moved to significance. Therefore, you prayed a prayer, but you never started living the life. You declared a faith statement, but you never started walking by faith. And I want to give you an opportunity this morning to make a great day of significance for your life. A lot of you in this room, you're struggling with something. And in just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer all together. And the prayer that we're all going to pray together is if you're struggling with something or you need salvation for the very first time, the prayer is all the exact same prayer. It's how you make it significant in your life. Because the word salvation means this. It doesn't mean a one-time event. It means a constant reoccurring of a salvation of a God who never gives up on you. It starts with an initial born-again experience, but it doesn't stop. It's a continual process of, I was saved from hell when I made the decision for Christ. I inherited heaven, but now I need to be saved from today's problems the same way I needed salvation from hell. We're so excited that you've joined us for this broadcast of The Way Bible Church. Thank you for your continued financial support to help this ministry bring the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world. If you'd like to financially support, go to TWBCSS.com. Also, follow us on all of our other social media outlets by looking up TWBCSS. You can also download our app at TWBCSS. Most importantly, join us here in person if you're ever in the Sulphur Springs area. Go to TWBCSS.com to find out all things about The Way Bible Church.